Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, I'm gonna be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Chris Watts during the police body cam footage of the day of the incident. I won't go too deep into the backstory of Chris in this video, just to be able to stick with community guidelines pretty well. If you would like to be able to hear a little bit more about that, there are a myriad of documentaries. I have already done one video on an interview done by Chris. There's a lot out there. This is a dark story. If you want to be able to hear a, an accurate and not dramatized version of the story, go check out JCS Criminal Psychology's video on him. It's fantastic, and I highly suggest it. Let's go ahead and run the intro. Okay, so as I said just a second ago, I've already done one video on this case. So you might be asking, what's the point of this video? Well, I wanted to be able to take a look at the body cam footage from the police officers who were some of the first people to respond to calls about the entire incident. So if we can look at that, there might be something that we could see during that footage that would have been a clue to the police officers had they been trained in nonverbal communication reading, that they might have been able to pick up on or not pick up on as the day went on. So we're going to look through that and then we'll be able to kind of talk about everything at the very end and you can let me know what your opinions are. But for a little tiny, just quick backstory on things, Chris met Shannon and they got married in 2012. Then in between 2012 and 2015, they had a couple of kids, two daughters, and during that year, during 2015, they also filed for bankruptcy, letting us know that their financial condition was not great and having children in financial difficulties is, well, difficult. So that happens. Fast forward three years and we see that they are having another child, or at least that's how Shannon announces it to Chris. And things seem to be going pretty well, except they're not. They're really not going too well at all. In 2018, everything unfolds. So a new child is announced. Chris starts seeing a woman named Nicole Kessinger, and they start a relationship that eventually develops into far more. And I was looking through the timeline of this to refresh on it, and I've, I've got to be honest. He starts talking to Nicole, and I think it's June of 2018. And then in August, two months later, he ends up killing his family. It's very, very rushed. He then admits to the murder of his family and is imprisoned all within the year of 2018. So that's your kind of sparks notes version of the storyline. Like I said, if you want to be able to really dive into the case, if you haven't heard of it before, it's very dark. You can check out plenty of the other things that are going around. For now, let's go ahead and open up this police body cam footage. I kept most of the entire thing through all of it. So as they're looking around the house, gathering information, I do fast forward in areas to be able to make it to where it doesn't just drag on. But I wanted to let you see what it looks like to gather all of this and then any portions where Chris is on screen and interacting, we are gonna actually let it play at normal time so that we can gather a nonverbal baseline across all of his channels, that includes voice, the face, and the body, across all of that to be able to see if we could understand where Chris showed some cracks in his lie. I hope that makes sense. Let's go ahead and start. Hi, sir. Here, I'm Officer James Frederick PD. What's your name? Nice to meet you. So we're just waiting for our sergeant to come over and we'd like to go through your house. Are you okay with yeah. us searching through your house? All right. Um, we'll have you sign a consent. Okay. So some notes that I want to make about Chris's nonverbal communication just in general, and this is across this video, which I'll talk about how I gathered this and also the other videos that I was able to watch. He is a fairly reserved human being that is also backed up by his neighbor, who they seem to have a fairly close relationship with, a neighbor's testimony of him being a very reserved and subdued 
personality. So that's going to play out in his nonverbal communication. He won't be as broad in areas with gestures. And if he is, then we'll have to keep track of that. But we just need to make sure that we understand what his normal behavior pattern is according to both research and testimony. So that's where it's at so far. Let's continue in on this. We just want to see if you left a note or anything okay. inconspicuous, something like that. All right. Um, so uh, if you're good with that, we'll have you sign a consent form okay. allowing us to search your house and okay. uh, we'll wait for our sergeant to get here. But okay. we'll grab that. You don't plan on going any, anywhere, right? No, I was just going to walk around the neighborhood just to uh, clear my head. Yeah. Which so I'm going to add some context to this. This is not the first time that a person has walked around Chris's house looking for evidence. This is the second time that this is being done. This one's the official one. I hope that makes sense. So he's also talking about where he has to walk around and clear his head. We'll revisit that closer to the end of this video because it's important, but it is important. Just wanted to add that context out there. Let's continue. What company do you work for? Anadarko. Anadarko. What do you do for him? Operator. So you work like seven days a week? Five and two, like Monday through Friday. I'm doing eight and six next month. All right, so I wanna make note of how he's answering questions. They're very straightforward and they're very brief. He's not lasting a long time. He's not adding a ton of details. He's not over explaining anything. He's very to the point, straightforward and clean cut with his answers. These are all establishing questions that the police officer is asking. I don't know if he's intending on asking these questions this way, but he is. It's allowing me to be able to see how Chris would respond to questions that aren't incriminating on any level. So that if there are times that he does happen to have to answer some of those questions, we can kind of compare and contrast. But that's what we're noticing so far from his verbal patterns. Very short, concise, no extra details. Let's continue. So today is Monday? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's let us grab that form and then uh, okay. we'll wait for our supervisor and then you can either stay here or you can go walk the neighborhood, whatever you'd like, but we look through it. All right, let's go grab that form. So Chris, it's your house. You can go inside with us if you'd like or you could stay out here. It doesn't matter to us. It doesn't matter, I mean, free range, whatever you gotta do. Okay. So I wanna point out something that many people are catching on, which <laughs> I know why Chris did it, and I know why it was wrong as far as him trying to pull off a, a good lie. And don't lie, just in general, it's safer to just tell the truth, but you know what I mean, I'm not getting into any sort of moral thing here. So Chris is trying to play off that he is completely fine and that everything is really chill. And he's doing so extremely well. The issue is, is that in the context of the situation, that doesn't fit. So where he's coming across as nonchalant, no big deal, it kind of feels as if maybe the police are asking about a stray dog that isn't even his dog or his neighbors or anybody that he's, they're just asking him about a dog. So he's just like, yeah, sure. You can check out my house. It's yeah, whatever. It's pretty fun. Pretty cool. I'm relaxed. I'm really relaxed. When in context, he should be showing more agitation. So it's that absence of expected, which if you expect a certain behavior, that is a trap to fall into to become biased but he's showing no signs of agitation in a circumstance that invokes agitation. His wife and kids are missing, missing at this point. So it's that absence of behavior that is a red flag. He does not make sense in context right now, but he's pulling off the nonchalant chill thing very, very well, too well. Let's continue. Like I can show on the deck on the side on the Okay, cool. all right. Whatever you'd like. How long have you guys been married? So, we've been together eight years, married six this year. Okay. And this is very unusual behavior? Yeah, can you get that dog out of here? Okay. She's gonna flip. So I'm gonna explain something here. You can see that Chris is walking off into the back to let the dog out the back so the dog doesn't bark the entire time. Now in the initial walk around that's already been done before this footage that I'm showing you here, he also disappears into the house 
for no apparent reason. Maybe it's to try to let the dog out. We don't know. We never get to see, and it's never explained. He just vanishes into the house while the police are there. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't welcome anybody in. He doesn't say, hey, can you hold on a second? Nothing. He just, he just pieces out. So that's suspicious then. So I don't know if you're asking, you know, why aren't we just looking at the first one? Because I wanted to be able to look at this in a light of Chris has had the opportunity to try to collect himself and the pressure has built up. So the initial time is more intense of he has no time to collect. The police are there. He has to respond very raw, very real. But the pressure isn't as high. Now the pressure is as high as more people are asking the questions. So it's just an odd dynamic. So what we're going to see is seepage from Chris in his various channels, but they're going to be more masked, if that makes sense. And then I'll show you something from the first clip at the very end of this so you can see the contrast. You know what? Let's just keep watching. You'll see. On the right here. Okay. Uh, so when you guys come home, do you usually use the front door or the garage door? How do you guys? I usually open the garage door, come in. Okay. She's front or garage. It's kind of thin. Okay. Is that a ring out there? So I also want to point out here another thing in Chris's baseline, his nonverbal communication, where it normally rests while he's speaking in these circumstances, is that he's very obvious with his gestures if he gestures when he's talking about things it's spatial and he uses some pretty broad gestures in that light so while he's subdued he does gesture fairly broadly and that's when he's telling genuine authentic facts or just speaking casually there's no incrimination centered around it that's important to be able to note because if there is other times or any other instances that pop up that that changes, it's a red flag for us. So we're establishing and we're really fleshing out how Chris behaves across his different channels so that we can understand how he behaves when he's being deceitful. Let's continue. Oh, that was... No, the doorbell, is that a ring doorbell? Yeah, like, it, like when, it, when you got a visitor, it does, and but I don't think the speaker is on to where you hear it, like by... Okay, my question... I guess my question for you is, would it show her leaving with the kids? Did you have yeah, any if alerts? She this, if she came out here, yes. Yeah. Like Did you have any alerts today with that? Just when her friends were here. Does it only record when the doorbell rings or anytime if someone... If you're like, right... It should just start the proximity should hit up. Okay, and if you had any, anything on that today? Just her friends. And what time was that? 12.10 and about uh, 10, 10 minutes afternoon. Okay. So nothing between the time when she got here. No, like morning. she got here at two. Only thing this morning. Was, yeah, two 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 o'clock this morning. Okay. Like one forty eight on here. And the only thing that was weird was that the garage door set is left open after I left. And it might have been the sensor, but like my phone doesn't show when it when for it your shuts. alarm. Yeah, it doesn't show if it shuts. And who's so, your alarm through? Vivid. So just basing it off of the loose baseline that we've come up with so far, non-verbally for Chris, he's starting to add some extra details where we know that he keeps his answers pretty concise. So in my mind, I would look at this and be like, okay, so these are fairly relevant, but some extraneous details to the question that's being asked. I should circle back around and ask some more pushing questions, more probing questions in this area later on so that there's no suspicion being raised. Because the other thing you don't want to do is throw up their guard. Because if you throw up their guard, then they will block everything off and it makes the read a lot more difficult. If you can find a way to circumvent and come back around and really keep their guard down, that will help you get a more accurate read. If they trust you, then you can trust what you can see in them. I hope that makes sense. Let's continue. Okay. But the Nikki, her friend that was that came here about 12, 10, she said the garage door shut when she got here. Okay. That was the only thing that was weird. All right. Were you going to hang out out oh, there or you yeah. want to come in here? Okay. Who's got asthma? I don't know. Kids need medication too, and apparently they didn't. She didn't take their medication either. Celeste, this is all their medication. 
Yeah, the bless the kid. Mm -hmm. So I, I left this in, like I said, so you could see the entire process. And the reason that this is important is because non-verbally speaking, we're already figuring out who Chris is non-verbally, just how he behaves. But alongside of that, if they're gathering details and adding more evidence to piles of ideas and concepts of which way this could go, then that helps add more weight to this. So now, since we're looking at this retrospectively, we can look at this and be like, okay, so Chris has had several behavioral things that were odd at the time, and we know now is because he was guilty, but they were odd at the time. And there's now this physical evidence alongside the nonverbal stuff that also amplifies this unsureness as to what's going on because something like an emergency inhaler has been left behind for the kids as the mom takes both kids and goes somewhere else and that's that's odd as well so now we've got odd stuff from chris we've got odd stuff in the house then it's still just it's just odd there's no there's no verdict yet it's just strange but there's more strange going on i hope that's making sense that's why i'm leaving these all in the video Let's continue watching. That's albuterol for a nebulizer. <laughs> so she doesn't have any family or anyone around here? Neither of them They're all back in North Carolina. Here back in 2012. Came out here to visit some friends during Thanksgiving, fell in love with the place, and died here a few months later. Does she have any friends around here? Just friends? Yeah. Yeah, she's got you know, friends in Frederick, Erie, Aurora, that part of Erie, Broomfield, Parker. Have you tried to contact any of them? Oh, yeah, we've exhausted. Once again, you can see as Chris is talking about various things, he's gesturing spatially regularly and fairly broadly. Another thing that you will be able to see as he continues to recount things is the genuine expression of recollection as he looks off to the side, narrows his eyes, and tries to recollect both visually and auditorily these memories. So you'll see that pop up as well. That's his genuine recollection and conversation. It's important for us to understand that so that we can see if there are any anomalies from it. Every option, I'm just, right, I think I'm gonna do with hospitals. I mean, hotels, I mean, there's so many, but... And no one's heard from her today? Have you checked your bank accounts? That's what another thing I was going to do, because I don't have access through here. Let's go check those and see if she pulled any cash out or uh, if there's any strange charges or anything. Okay. Can you log... I can't log in because she 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 does all the finances. Okay. So I, I know her password. I just don't have her used already. I'm not sure what she would have used that way. Sorry, my phone's just blowing up right now. No, you're fine. Um, who do you guys... Another interesting behavioral thing there is that his phone does ring and he immediately rejects it. Now, people have brought up the idea, well, if, if he was looking for his wife and kids, why would he immediately reject that phone call? And I was trying to do some thinking as to why that could be in context of both, both possibilities of him being guilty and him being not. Say he's guilty, then it's obvious he knows that she is not out there, so he doesn't need to take any phone calls about it, concerning it or anything, ever. He just doesn't need to take any phone calls because he knows what the answer is. It could be that, maybe it is in this case. If he were innocent, then it could be perhaps that he saw on the caller ID that it was somebody that he knew, that they said they were going to call back, or it was a spam call or something like that. These are far more unlikely, while this seems more likely. Now, at that time, they don't know. They don't know the answer, so they just kind of have to keep track of it, weigh the pros and the cons of each one to figure out which one's the truth. So at this point, though, we have a massive pile of evidence towards Chris's possible guilt and not as much of a pile of evidence for his innocence. I hope that's making sense. Let's continue. You guys bank through? USAA and Chase. Can you call them and see if yep. there's been any activity? Any withdrawals or anything? And then the suitcases that she came home this morning with, which ones were those? Was the, it was the, the black one? one that's sitting right there. Not the one in the bedroom? Mm -mm. That was from the last trip, we, or when we just got back a few days ago from North Carolina. She went to Arizona like two days later. That was when we just got put back down in the, in the basement.
you guys don't have any stock piles of cash or anything in the house that she would have had. If she needed cash, she needed to go to the bank to get it. If there is, I would not know about it. I mean, if there was, I didn't know. Do you know how much cash she usually carries with her? It's usually not made like a hundred. Okay, so now you can see some different nonverbal patterns that are slipping in to Chris's behaviors. Where he's normally been a little bit more stable, he's more subdued, and he gestures broadly while recollecting. Now he has his hands thoroughly at his sides. I believe they're even in his pockets. And he's starting to do this agitated rocking back and forth, stepping and shifting motion, which is, like I said, <laughs> A sign of agitation. So something around this area of questioning is causing him a significant enough amount of agitation to make him start to display this way. So in their eyes, they might have noticed this. I'm hoping they picked up on this, but he's now behaving differently centered around these questions. That's important to make note of because it's a variance from his baseline. And any time that that happens, you have to ask what is causing that and should we be suspicious of it? Should there be more questions? Anything along those lines. Hope that makes sense. Let's continue. Like 15 plus, very kind of big, back to cabin being served. she have a passport? Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. I'm sure she does. Uh, she's got Kids have passports? No. They're they old enough. How old are they? Four and three. Yeah, no. Oh, they're okay. No, they have to travel anywhere other countries. Yeah, they have passports for all of them. Oh, okay. So that taxi cab. So they're talking about the kids now, and he's continued to maintain his agitated pacing and rocking back and forth and keeping his arms very close into his body which we know is a sign of agitation from him. And then he does this specific pose that I've paused on here where he's holding, holding himself very tightly. He's got his arms very tightly wrapped around and it's this bracing, holding gesture. This isn't a normal like crossing your arms. It's not for relaxation or anything along those lines. It seems to be based out of nerves. This would be considered the classic blocking gesture. So in this area, something around the kids is causing him a significant amount of agitation. Big red flag, let's continue. Service, did you guys use anything like that? Uh, that might be good. Uh, okay. And if you look through here and see if all of her cards are here? He doesn't know how many she has. I don't know how many she has. Did she have different ones than me as far as credit cards go? I think we have the same debit cards, the same account, but like... These are, these are debit cards? Yeah, those are the same, same account. Then... Do your kids have like a favorite pair of shoes that they normally wear? A favorite pair of shoes? Yeah. No, they, have, they have all their shoes are in the closet right here. Do you know which ones they normally wear? Like, like whatever they want to wear, they say, I say, pick your shoes and go through them. Bella's on this side, Tootsie's on that side. Sure. Do your kids take any medication? TT takes Singular and that's all. How often? Singulars every night for allergies and methadol for the kind of for like the has to be plus. Is one of them on inhalers? They they haven't done it since they got back. Um, I think it might have ran out because the last one I saw had zero on it, so we hadn't rebuilt that one yet. From North Carolina. Yep. And when did you guys get back? I think it was so it would be I went back to work on the eighth, so we got back on the seventh. Okay. And then she left Arizona on Friday got back last night. 
she have the kids with her last night? Yes. Or you have the kids? Oh, I had the kids, like, all weekend. Okay. So there's just some interesting things going on here. I've watched a fair segment of it. He is adding some details centered around the kids' shoes. It's fairly extraneous, but maybe he wasn't sure what their question was centered around, so he's just trying to provide extra details. So at that moment, that wouldn't have been too big of a red flag, but it is a little extraneous, so keeping track of it. There's still some more, some more extra processing that's happening around the kids that should have been tracked. Maybe it was. Along with that, he seems to be pretty in tune with how the children's medications go, which is, I mean, just something to take note of, of himself. He's at least detail-oriented enough to be able to track that sort of thing as well. So that's interesting. But on the front of his verbiage, he does all in all a decent job at maintaining the correct tense of his words. So instead of saying they were or they had or anything along those lines, he says they are and they have and keep it present. One of the tells that can slip out and oftentimes does is a person will mix up the tenses of the people concerned. So had he said they didn't do or they weren't doing or they never had or anything along those lines in that past tense, the question would be, why did you refer to it as such? And he says a haven't in here. And I think it's a haven't. Since the audio isn't very clear, it might have been a hadn't. And if that's the case, that would be one of those verbal slip ups. Hard to say, just wanted to make note of it. He does a pretty impressive job at keeping his tenses straight throughout his lie. Let's continue. They went to a birthday party yesterday. Over at the friend's house street. And then, is someone sleeping in the- So, I find that interesting when he's talking about the birthday party, his gestures come back in over at the friend's house across the street. I would believe him. I think that they went to a birthday party over across the street at the friend's house. That's how his gestures indicated. His body language showed us that, that is likely to be authentic, so I would believe him there. In the basement? I did a few times. The separation thing, I just- How, how recently? Probably about two nights ago, three nights ago, well, when she was here. So, probably last time was Thursday, Thursday night, Friday. Okay. And then your kids, do they sleep in their own bed? So, so far, he's keeping up with that. As he's talking about these things, he's gesturing and using his normal baseline that we would expect, that we kind of built from here. So, we can say, yeah, he's probably telling the truth. That whole narrative, at least this bit of it, seems to be true. Yeah, do they they sleep with you those, guys? those two adjacent rooms, I connected that bathroom. You're lucky. <laughs> we know we're lucky. I know. They, uh, so like when she she got back from the airport last night, usually like she just she just don't take bed. Like most of the time when she does that, she'll want to wash the sheets the next day to get the airport off them because she just, just came off the airport. Okay. That's the only thing I can think of. The she they were still on it. When oh yeah, she was in bed. bed. Yeah. <laughs> so you were in that bed last night? Yeah. That was up there because. The monitor and stuff was up there, oh, waiting for her to get back home. And then she works from home, is that right? Yes, direct sales. Okay. So her, yeah, she works from phone and anything, the computer. Uh, and then is that the office thing. she uses for work? Oh, she, she can so a lot of questions have started being more intentional here, asking specifically about Shannon and his agitation and pacing and shifting of his weight has once again returned. I do believe this is just an underlying level of nervousness centered around that because he's still gesturing and what he's saying isn't incriminating, but you could see that it, it, it at least bothers him that they're asking these questions centered around that because this spike in his nonverbal communication has shown up that we know is related to nerves agitation. So what we can know is that what he's talking about is likely accurate. What he's feeling about it is intense nerves more so than other areas of the conversation. It is a subtle red flag, but I mean, we're at least aware of it now. Let's continue. You can do anywhere in here. She's on the couch. Oh, okay. She doesn't have like a designated area. No. Right. Just go anywhere. And you can't think of anywhere she'd want to go. She uh, go for walks around here. No, I go for runs. She goes, she doesn't really go for, do anything as far as going for walks or anything. And you talk to all the friends you guys have around the area? Mm -hmm. 
And what was the conversation this morning you guys had? It was about the selling the house and the separation. And how'd she take that? We were both very emotional, both crying. And then did you see her before you went to work? Did mm-hmm. you say anything to her? Well, she went back, like, well, she told me she was going to go to the friend's house and be with the kids, take the kids with her. Oh, she told you she was taking the kids yeah. to the friend's house? Yeah. She didn't say who, though. Oh, no, no. No, but she was still in bed when that happened. Uh, This part, I'm not buying as much. If you've paid attention, his arms have locked down to his sides. He's not looking off to the side for recollection on any level. He's maintaining direct eye contact with the officer talking. And his gestures have all but disappeared. And his agitation, postural shift, has continued. So in this area, I would be like, I don't don't believe this. There's something around this that's causing him to stray from his baseline. Something's making him display differently. We have to find out what and why. So at this point, this would be a red flag. I would try to pull one of the other officers aside and talk to them and be like, hey, this is the situation. This is what I'm seeing. This is where we should probably push. Something's off here. Let's continue. And this was after the conversation? Yeah, it was between like 4 or 5 a.m. I woke up about 4 o'clock. What time did she get home? 148. So did you guys sleep for a little while and then? Oh yeah, yeah like I was passed out when she got home. And then did you wake her up? Yeah, when I got up. And that's when you discussed yeah. that? Yeah, issue? I, I, I didn't want to do it like over a text or over a phone call. I wanted to be face to face. How long did that conversation last? Like? I left 30, 45 minutes. And then you went to work? Mm-hmm. I went to, I left about 515, 530 for in that time frame. His gestures are coming back. I do believe that at the point where he starts talking about him going to work, that's more going to fall back in line to the truthful part of his lie, which he tries to tell a lie that intertwines truth very closely with the lie, and that is how you can pull off a more convincing lie. In this front, though, his behavior is what's giving him away as he's now slipping back into his normal patterns that lets us know for sure that that entire segment where they're talking about the morning of, so I think it's earlier this morning that we're looking at as far as time frame goes, that that time frame something happened that caused him to display so differently from his normal baseline. And in this case, the question would be, why is he displaying there so differently? And considering the rest of the evidence, What is this all adding up to? And it's not really adding up towards innocence, as we know, but, you know, let's see how it plays out. She was going to her friend's house with you. But she was still here when I left. You went to a job site or you went to the main plant or where'd you go? I went to location first. What was that? By by Hudson, over there, East Hudson. There was someone there at the time when you got there? No, no, Uh, one of the operators. He had an issue there on Friday, something going over the weekend. I went over there just to kind of verify what kind of issue was he was he was having, see if I could fix it. Then we went to a pumping unit across the across the ranch over there. I was there most of the day. That's when I got the phone calls and text messages. Are you guys on like Canada 49? Where are you guys at? Oh, like you know, like rocking it. Yep. Yeah, out there. Who's your entry on? Okay, so. This is interesting because he's still having some odd patternings that are going on around this, but mm, I'm not sure that he's totally telling the truth here. I don't remember exactly where he deposited the bodies, but (sighs) this element of it where he's talking about the person having some difficulties and he had to go and check it, he's doing his gestures correctly but he's still maintaining this agitated behavior. So perhaps perhaps the storyline that he's saying of there's a difficulty and he's either going to check it or he did check it or something along those lines, there are elements of that that are true. Ergo, the authentic body language that we've established mixed in with this odd agitated body language as well. So this is getting muddy in this area. Let's continue to see how it plays out. Yeah. Derby. Okay. I know where that's at. So what kind of tools did you have to load up in the garage? It was just mainly my got my water bottles, my water jug, my computer, book bag, 
I had my containers full of just uh, my O-rings, all that stuff, just putting it all in there because I took it out a lot. Big gestures are back. He's back into talking about things that aren't even remotely incriminating, so his baseline has returned. So he's using the big gestures and direction and spatial and everything is inclusive again. And so this is where we can see that contrast between the genuine and the fake masking deceit level of body language. Let's continue. Every day. I'll just like on the Monday, like after I get all that stuff, because I had an issue where somebody stole all my tools out of my truck. My pipe wrenches are gone. My socket set's gone. My... Well, my wrench that's gone. Like we had an issue. I, that's why I parked my truck in front of the neighbor's house that for like a few days just to see if like I could see if anybody was breaking it. I tried to break it into my truck again. It was my fault. I left it a lot. So as far as the toolbox is on the back. So on the weekend you download your stuff. Mm -hmm. And then on Monday you load it. Oh yeah, I just put it all back in. Just yeah. to kind of get everything out of my truck, clean it out a little bit from the whole week because yeah. it gets filled. How long you guys lived here since 2012 or a different house? No, like, so 2012, we moved here, lived in a friend's basement in Broomfield. Okay. And we had, we closed on this house. It was built 2013 in May, and that's when we moved in there. Okay. Does she have any other friends in this neighborhood? No, nah, I mean, we haven't talked to many people around here, honestly. It's mostly in Erie, yeah, in Broomfield? Erie, Broomfield, Frederick. Uh, Where at in Frederick, do you know? So we had, like, they just lived up here in Frederick Way. They actually just moved down to Thornton, Nick and Amanda Thayer. Okay. Uh, Nikki, she lives up, the one that was here, she lives in Frederick. The one that dropped her off? Yep. Okay. Yeah, she lives, like, uh, over there building that new stoplight out on bridge over there. Right. Okay. And you have no, no idea of what friend? So all your friends pretty much have kids the same age? Mm-hmm. So it's hard to. It's really hard. I mean, we've exa I've exhausted every option I know of as far as friends goes. Like Nikki knew, knew more of them because she's a woman, and that's about, that's about as far as we could go as far as all the friends that we could think of. All right. So if you talk to some of her friends, um, tell them that we're looking for, her and we just need to make sure that she's okay, and uh, she can call us. She doesn't have to call you. Um, that if that's what she's worried about, about, you know, you're trying to get a hold of her and she won't talk. So I will note that his nonverbal communication has fallen back into this self hug thing that he does here, and this still falls in line with a self soothing gesture. It doesn't necessarily have to crop up at a time that he's feeling intense agitation, it just simply means that he is self soothing at that time. So he can use it to be able to walk down from agitation or anything along those lines. It's just self soothing. So the fact that it's popped up here. It hasn't popped up around a specific point of the conversation, but it has popped up after he just got done doing a lot of gestures and movements, and he's soothing himself back down from that high that he was just in. So let's let's just see how this goes. You will have them refer her to us if they know where she's at. Okay. Just so we, whatever's going on between you guys, that's between you guys, and she doesn't want to talk to you, that's fine. We just don't want to waste resources looking for her. If she's actually okay. So, like, if you can relay to the friends, hey, I understand if she doesn't want to talk to us, at least have her call the police so that they know she's okay. Okay. Type deal. If right. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that way that we know that she's okay and whatever's going on between you guys, you guys can kind of figure that out. Okay. Type deal. Um, do you have any questions for us before we get out of here? Mm -hmm. I mean, call area hospitals, call hotels. That's, that, I mean. Someone said she was diabetic? She had. Her friend Cassie in Arizona, she's a nurse, and she knows she had low blood sugar when she was down there. That's, that's why I brought that up. Oh, okay. She never had seizures or blacked out or anything before. It was just like, that was a long, long time ago before I even met her. She had a horrific car accident. I think she might have blacked out or had a seizure. They just couldn't really figure it out. Like, she just had a car accident. She just flew out of the car. And you have his contact info? Yeah. Or I think the detective did. Yeah, they did. Okay. And if you hear, uh, did you get a card or anything? From the detective, yeah. Okay. So there's a dispatch number on there? Okay. If you hear anything from her, uh, call that number and let us know. And it'll just go straight to our dispatch, and then an officer will call you right back. Okay. Uh, that way, our, our main concern is to make sure she's okay and the kids are okay. So 
Um, if you hear a peep from her, just call us and we'll call you or leave us a contact number to reach her so we can talk to her. Okay. What's yeah. your date, bro? 51585. What's that? 51585. 85? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and pause it here. And to recap what we've established about Chris, that's that, that body cams footage. They walk out to their car after that and it's over. So what we've noticed about Chris is that while subdued, he gestures broadly and spatially when telling authentic events. Along with that, his recollection is quite obvious as he looks off to the side, often narrowing his eyes as he tries to recall. And that is a fairly universal tell of genuine recollection. So as he's talking about genuine things, authentic things, things that really happened, we know how he behaves. So in certain hot point areas centered around Shannon and the girls and their activities in the morning, he shows spikes from his nonverbal communication. Where there was the presence of broad gestures and recollection expressions before, those have been subdued. They have been frozen, so they are a negative spike in his baseline. And then before, where he's fairly steady and reserved with his baseline, he starts to have an agitated rocking, shifting, and pacing cluster. That would be a spike from his nonverbal baseline. So in that area, there's both a negative and positive spike across various channels that help us understand that there is an important something centered around that that should be pushed more. So that's letting us know from this time that he's been able to collect and prepare a little bit from the first walk around to this one, that's what we were still able to see. And since he does have the chance to do all of that collecting from the first one, this is how we know that we're getting a more accurate baseline from him. So he's worked through the initial nerves, we can see a real baseline and see what falls out of that, see what slips from the cracks, so to speak. Now we're going to shift over to the first walk around where they're in the neighbor's house looking at security camera footage of the morning of and talking about some of the stuff there. And we'll get to see how he displays so that you can see the contrast of what a very anxious Chris Watts looks like in regards to his nonverbal behavior and baseline. So let's watch that. What's that? My stuff up, my coolers, my water jugs, my book bag, my computers, some of the tools that I have from the toolbox. I knew I was going to have to do some pumping, pumping in the rubbers today. That's why I was out so far. Is this on con continually yep. recording? Yep. Well, it's not. Is it motion, motion or is it? Event. Okay, so it's motion. Any motion event that happens, I got. But I get cars driving. So while Chris is looking up at the officer during this time, it, that might be seen as a partial fear expression. The widening of the eyes, the upper eyelid is pulled fully back, and the lower jaw is dropping lightly. That could be seen as at least a partial fear expression. I'm not totally sold on that front. He does have that habit of looking up out at the top of his eyes like that, so it could just be his baseline. But I've made note of it. I'm keeping track of it. It would make sense in context, but at the time, it would just simply be something to keep track of. Let's continue. From this street, and this is him at 517. Park out there on the side, I just want to get everything going. Be easier to run everything out there. So you can see him still gesturing. Broadly, he's talking about authentic things, so that makes sense. Let's keep watching. Okay, now we're starting to see things ramp up for him. He turns away and takes deep breath. That means that he's feeling like he's short of breath. Indicator of fear, anxiety, nerves, something centered around that. You could also see that he might be starting to sweat just a little tiny bit. These two things are psychophysiological things that you can't really control too well. They happen kind of involuntarily. So to see those pop up, that means that he is genuinely feeling the pressure here. Now he does a very overt hands interlocked and behind his head. This is a very overt tell of agitation, nerves, and stress. 
something around this video is causing him an intense amount of stress, so much so that it's starting to just escape whether or not he wants it to. Let's keep watching this. You can see him focusing on his breathing more there. He feels like he's out of breath, indicator of intense stress. Um, my detective just showed up. Um, so he'll probably want to talk to you. He probably, like I said, he might have you call at the bank and see if there's any kind of activity. Um, because if there is any sort of action out there, his camera, like, I would have got it. Like right. we had, I had, we had issues the other other week when people were coming, were stealing stuff out of like garages and stuff like that. And I have parked my car. I right had your park right here. Yeah. There's someone. See if I can see happened. where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver over there, and it was just like. But if any action would have happened, any cars or anything left yeah. your house, I would have been like right in that area. It should have picked. I mean, oh, it'll pick up anything coming down the street this way. Oh yeah. Okay. Watch, I'll show you. There's nothing on here. <laughs> Interesting. As soon as the neighbor brings up, oh yeah, it'll pick anything up down the street or anything. That causes Chris a little bit more discomfort as his pacing, his agitation tell kind of increases there as well. I don't think Chris knew that you could see that much with that camera, but you can, and it's made him uncomfortable. Everybody watch that one. But like, you'll see this car. This is where you can see that. This car. You can see this car starting to drive down the street. All right, well. Oh, what's See what I'm saying? They picked it up all the way down there. He's next door. Can we go? I'm talking about dispatch. It'll be close for. Yeah, we can pick up cars coming this way. I get anything coming this way and make it a turn. So, and usually at night I pick up the car for a year trip. So, unless they pull it right here, yeah. but I would have caught her walking out. Ooh, that doesn't settle well with Chris. You can see him starting to do self-soothing gestures on every level. He's pacing more. He's rubbing his area here around his super sternal notch. He's wiping his hands on his pants. He's walking around. He's very agitated to find out that this security camera can see this much. I bet you at this point, he's very worried that something could be seen of what he did that morning. Probably running through his mind right now. His mind is probably racing. Let's continue watching. Diesel. Hey, yeah, I thought nothing. Nothing for the rest of the day. No, that's it. She's pregnant as well. How far along? 14, 15 weeks. That's why her friend said it was low blood sugar. Let's see. I've got her friend leaving out here at you know, two in the morning. I think. My camera.
So we can see there that Chris has walked away. He walked away from the situation, and I think that's for two two main reasons. One, he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be in that situation. We know that the idea, the concept of the security camera really stresses him out for a good reason. So he wants to get away from that situation. But along with that, if he were innocent and they were still looking through footage, it would make less sense for him to walk away. If there's something that they could see, wouldn't it make sense for him to be there and glued to the TV to see if there's anything that could be seen? Well, he knew that there wasn't going to be anything that could be seen today or anything along those lines because it all took place far before that, but it's just adding information to it. She dropped her off at 1 in the morning, right? Uh, she's, that my doorbell said 148, she came in. That was the start of the video. Yep. I didn't pick her up going into the house, though. I didn't. And I usually pick him up when he comes walking through here. Mm -hmm. I pick him up. So it doesn't show her walking into the house. She would have walked by when he gets off. Is it typically record for 30 seconds? So we could still see that Chris is doing his self hug. He's still doing some manipulators with his hands to, I don't know, maybe fix his pants is what he'll play it off as. Also to rub his palms on his pants to keep them from sweating too much. So that's showing up. He's showing so many signs of agitation centered around this. Along with that, you could still see that he feels as if he's out of breath. It's still all centered around this security camera in the morning. Very interesting stuff. But this is at 148, and then the next one I have is in the yeah. whatever. So nothing, no cars came through, because I guarantee with the headlight, they picked up the headlight. Oh, yeah. automatically. And my vivid said that at 527, my garage door was left open. shut during the day, but I think when Nikki's uh, son, he may try to move the, the, the door around, maybe when they were trying to get in the door, in the garage right. door, and if I broke the, the laser there, that's because this, my alarm started going off. A lot of nerves centered around this, a lot of false starts. He starts over again, he says things wrong and then restates it, and he's adding a lot of extraneous details around this this sensor of the garage sort of thing. Needless details, it's a sign of nerves. We're still just kind of accruing red flags at this point. Well, I know he said the front door he tried going in, but he had the lock yeah, up. That's, that's for so the that's so it all, right. Our remote on the outside doesn't work anymore. It got wet and the whole radio on the back. So yeah, that was it. 
Uh, all right. Appreciate your time. Hopefully something comes up here. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of the video that I'm playing here. To add a little bit more context after that, and the events surrounding one, when he walks out of there, shortly thereafter, he starts the video that we just watched. So he has a little bit of time to collect from this state that he's in here to the next one. That's where we can rely on that more accurate, relaxed baseline from him because he's been able to walk himself down from intense agitation. I wanted to be able to show you this clip so that you could see the contrast, the genuine full contrast between relaxed Chris Watts and very stressed Chris Watts. So he walks out to do that. After he walks out, the neighbor and the officer speak for a bit and the neighbor shows that Chris has backed his truck up into the garage to where you can't see anything being loaded or taken out of it, which he said was odd. He had never seen Chris ever do that before. He also brought to light the behavioral patterns that we were picking up on to the officer of being like, he doesn't normally behave like this. He doesn't talk a lot like he was been, like he talked during this time. This is very strange. He's acting strange. And this is one of those character testimony style things that you kind of have to, you, you want to listen to and hear if there's anything that might be true there, but also kind of take with a grain of salt because everybody can perceive things differently. So with all of that considered, at this point, had I been with the officers, maybe helping out with something or something along those lines, or if they had asked for me to help out, then at that point, I would have brought them everything that I had noticed. And I would have also told the people that were going to be running the polygraph a little bit later, let them know what I saw, because that often works hand in hand quite closely with a nonverbal analyst. So with all of this information considered, everything considered in context, going over the different channels and looking at it, with a fairly detailed look, then we could say that we're very, very, very suspicious of Chris Watts, and here's why, and pursue further. Wasn't necessary in this one. Fortunately, it really wasn't necessary because he cracked very quickly. Uh, everything happened so quickly in this, in this timeline of everything seeming to be fine to not fine at all. It was quite shocking. So... I hope you enjoyed this. I hope that this was informational. I know, like I said, this is this was different, right? It, it's another one of something that I already did, but I wanted to show you what it kind of would really look like in a more applicable setting, not just an interview, not an interrogation room, but something like police body cam footage. So that's what it looks like. Let me know what you felt in the comments below. Is there something that I've missed or if you just have any extra information that you think would just add more weight to the case or anything along those lines, let me know in the comments below. If you would like to be able to see more videos, be it of true crime, of YouTube drama, of reality TV, whatever have you centered around nonverbal communication, let me know in the comments below. I do try to track them as best as I can. Sometimes it's a little hard to be able to keep up, but if I see something that's been requested just way more than everything else, I'll probably get around to it. So, you know, I don't know, hit the comments section up pretty heavy for all those different things like subscribe, do all those things if you feel like it. As always, this channel is partnered with the Emotional Intelligence Academy in the UK. They offer a master's degree centered around communication, behavior, and finding these sorts of patterns. So if you're interested in doing kind of what I do and would like to be able to have some very reliable, accredited information, and education on it, check out the link in the description below. If you do follow my link and go through my page, you do get some pretty tasty discounts. There's even one course that's marked down 50% for people who sign up through my link. It's getting to the truth. It's a little bit of a crash course, so it's a good one to be able to wet your feet with, so to speak kind of get a feel of the field itself. And then you could look at the other ones. Everything else has a 10% discount. So, I mean, check it out. It's literally college level education with a discount through the channel. So I worked a long time to get that to happen. So if you would like to be able to have that happen as well, I highly suggest it. I'm going through it as well. So I don't know, take that or leave that as you will. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for today. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.